Okay, welcome. Uh, glad you're tuning in for this particular video. Uh, you'll probably notice that um, this is not the typical setting for our classes in the Book of Daniel, uh, nor is this my typical outfit or, the, or anything. Um, we had an issue with our recording of our class on Daniel 7 just a couple of days ago. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't unable to be recorded, which is really, really sad because we had lots of good comments during that class. Um, but seeing as how we can't uh, recreate that, uh, this is the best we can do. Um, what I'd like to do with you during this time period, if you're, if you're watching and I appreciate that, is go back through the lesson, uh, look at Daniel 7 again, um, look at some of the things we can notice, kind of take a moment, talk about apocalyptic literature, uh, which is an important subject given the fact that it's present here and in Ezekiel and most heavily in Revelation, uh, where it gets its name from. Um, but glad you've been able to join us. Uh, let's dive into our study. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work properly. All right. Seems to be the case. What we find in the book of Daniel, uh, specifically Daniel chapter 7, is Daniel experiences a vision or, or a dream during the first year of Belshazzar. Now this would put this during the Babylonian Empire, so it hasn't quite changed over to the to the Medes and Persians and so forth, as is described uh, in even Daniel six or Daniel, yeah Daniel five. Um, so what winds up happening is he has a vision, and in this vision Daniel sees just some really bizarre, spectacular, strange uh, beasts coming up, as it says there, out of the great sea in verse two of Daniel seven. Now, we've experienced this same progression of four uh, in Daniel chapter 2 when Nebuchadnezzar has his vision of a great statue. You remember the statue has the head of gold, chest of silver, uh, thighs of bronze, and then legs of iron, and then there's some clay mixed in there at the bottom, uh, which is more, more a testament to its quality and, less that it, and really not the fact that it's a, a fifth thing. That's really not a thing. But here in Daniel 7, we get four beasts that come up out of the, out of the great sea. Uh, the lion with the eagle's wings, the bear with three ribs in its mouth raised up on one side, the many-headed and winged leopard, and then the beast, which isn't described to be a dragon, but it certainly sort of gives that impression, a terrifying and dreadful and extremely strong beast. These four come up in succession, and then in the vision, we're followed by this scene of the throne of God. Uh, the text doesn't say that this is God, but I think pretty clearly from, from the description, this is who's being described in Daniel 7 and verse 9, the Ancient of Days takes his seat. And it says there, uh, the description of his throne being on fire and his, his wheels are on fire. Everything's on fire. And then a court is being convened and books are open. And you can sort of see that here in this artwork. Um, Daniel 7 is not short on individuals attempting to portray the visions using whatever means they can. And maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's appropriate for us to do that. The Bible doesn't have illustrations. It has word pictures. And sometimes those pictures translate well to, to artwork. Daniel keeps looking as the fourth beast is summarily just destroyed by the one on the throne. And then he's followed by the one known as the Son of Man. Now the Son of Man is of course a very important subject later on as Jesus would refer to himself uh, as, as the Son of Man. Um, in keeping both with this and I think some and with, with Ezekiel's use of, or God's use to Ezekiel of, of the term. The Son of Man is presented before the Ancient of Days. He is given uh, the reins to the kingdom. He's given uh, as it says there, glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. In short, where God reigns, which is everywhere and every when and every one, Jesus, or the Son of Man, is given reign. He is given dominion. He is given uh, the right to rule this kingdom. And then the rest of the chapter is spent explaining what's going on. And we're going to get to that explanation in just a moment. But what a really incredible way to begin. Uh, what an incredible vision to get to discuss. And then we want to think more about what this means on the big picture scale, what it meant to Daniel, and then what we can learn from it 
uh, together. If you've been following our classes, you'll notice, oh, sorry, forgot about this part. Daniel 7, along with all other apocalyptic literature in Scripture, is the place where everyone who wants to form an interesting opinion, and I'm putting this as kindly as possible, everyone who wants to form an interesting opinion and defend it goes there because they think it matters in some sense other than the way it's actually written. Uh, this was telling. I was on I was on my device and I typed in Daniel seven and, and then just left it to do its predictive you know whatever. And so many people have searched Daniel seven and the Russians, that it actually pops up as one of the options here. Now I don't I don't intend to disappoint, but if you're looking for information on the Russians, Daniel seven's the wrong place to go. Uh, I don't know that there's a right place in Scripture to go for that information, but it's just telling on how many people try to connect the events of Daniel 7 and, and even later in the book of Daniel to whatever's happening in their own time period. Um, whatever, and I've said this before in Ezekiel, whatever the big bad guy is in your time, there's a tendency to take that and, and shoehorn it into uh, the description of the big bad guy in whatever apocalyptic text you're reading. We got to remember first that the Bible was not written to us; it was written for us. It was written to an original audience, and the Bible has to first mean something to that original audience. And the original audience in Daniel seven would not have been concerned with the Russians. Uh, in Harkrider's commentary on Revelation, which is actually uh, the next class we're going into, uh, Lord willing, next year, I love this line. Uh, because it's true of Revelation, and it's true of Daniel 7, and it's true of other apocalyptic texts. Uh, he said, because Revelation has been the paradise of every biblical crank and fanatic, one must be careful not to choose an explanation simply because it excites his imagination or because it is written in an interesting style. Uh, it is true. Those who seek to gain notoriety by their new and interesting and, you know, not scandalous, but... Uh, What's the word? I don't know. Uh, when they're trying to get attention by doing this, this, this is what happens. Uh, as Harkrider says there, uh, we should seek to know whether the interpretation fits the context of the book and of the Bible. Right. So locally, within Daniel, does it make sense? And then globally, with Scripture, does it make sense? Um, on apocalyptic literature, I did want to say a, a, a brief uh, sort of word about this. It gets its name from the... Greek text of, of Revelation, which of course is the original. Uh, the opening word is apocalypsis. Apocalypsis simply means, as you can probably see there on screen, revelation. Uh, it means something that is being disclosed. It is something that was hidden and is no longer being hidden. Um, the word itself uh, appears in Luke 2, it appears in Ephesians 1, uh, and, and maybe there are some other places I'm not familiar with. But the literature that is in the style of what we find in Revelation, which is highly symbolic, uh, that literature is called apocalyptic from the word apocalypsis. One person put this, and I thought it an interesting take on it, it's like looking at a political cartoon. It is a picture drawn in a dramatic fashion with highly symbolic elements that the original audience would have understood. And that's an important thing to remember. The original audience of Daniel 7 would have understood the images given therein. Okay, or, And if not, you see even in Daniel 7 there's an explanation as to what exactly is going on. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, I went over this in class. I won't spend a lot of time going over it today. But I, I put up this political cartoon, and it's from quite a, quite a while back. But it is a picture with a point. You'll notice that um, in the picture here, the, the, the government and the government expenses are obviously much larger than the taxpayer sitting on the left, which is indicative of you know, its power and its you know, relative size. You can see here that the government seems to be consuming all of the national revenue by way of taxes. Now, you could simply just say the government consumes national revenue by way of taxes. Or, you could draw a picture, as has been done here, labeling the different parts, which gives you more of a sense of the way the author feels about what's going on. Now, you can see clearly from this 
the author is none too happy that this is happening. And that's something that's important with this style of literature that we see in Daniel 7, we see in Revelation and other places. It is not merely information. It's information with a point. Uh, the symbols and the pictures that are depicted, they are not the point themselves. Okay, the point of the, you know, the first beast in Daniel 7 is not that it's a lion with wings of an eagle that eventually stands on two feet like a person. It's, in, it's representative of a nation, in this case Babylon, and so on with the other beasts and, and this kind of thing. Um, in terms of the symbol or the picture making sense to its audience, um, you don't have to go too far back to find political cartoons where if you showed them to, let's say, a class full of fifth graders today, they wouldn't have maybe have the slightest clue, unless they're good history students, as to what exactly is being talked about. Um, in the picture here on the right, if I, you know, if I said, what's the scene, what's the context, those that understand the context, in this case, World War II, uh, predominantly probably the end of World War II, wherein, you know, England and the United States and Russia have all sort of worked together to defeat the Axis powers, right? You can see there uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and uh, Stalin. You... To understand these things, you have to understand the context in which they're written. And this is something that would have been possible in Daniel chapter 7. But anyway, enough on that. We, we talked a little bit more about that in, in, in the class. Um, Tommy Peeler, uh, who has done just a tremendous amount of work in the Old Testament, came up with this list, and I, I really appreciate this. Um, it is a list of characteristics of apocalyptic literature, and I won't put, I won't, you know, belabor all of this. You can see there I've highlighted, in, at least in Daniel, where you see some of these elements in Daniel 7. But this style of literature tends to follow a, a few basic rules. Uh, it tends to describe a conflict between good and evil. The evil is portrayed as not this weak, helpless thing, but as this great, monstrous destructive force and at least for a moment it it doesn't appear that every that everything's going to go well there's this there's this scene usually where it looks like evil is about to triumph and you can kind of see that in daniel 7 um the fourth beast is dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong it devours crushes tramples it has iron teeth it, it has one of its horn that's uttering great boasts. This isn't a, a cowering in the corner type thing. This is a beast that appears as if he's going to rule and dominate the entire world. Apocalyptic literature has that flavor to it, that, that evil is unstoppable. Um, and then usually at the last moment or at the, at the critical moment, whenever all is lost, God steps in, defeats the enemy, with overwhelming force, restores his people, delivers his people, encourages them, however, whichever text you're talking about. And then there's this admonition or this, this sense that we need to remain true to the one who is winning the victory. Uh, I, I won't go into all of that, but th that's sort of just sort of a brief synopsis. Now, what we do as Bible students, and something I've encouraged um, my own students to do, around students, uh, fellow students there in our classes, is when we read scripture, try to come up, sorry, I'm doing a bit of adjusting here. There we go. Um, when we read scripture first, let's just observe what's happening. Let's look at what's going on. How is it set up? What's, what's, what stands out to you? What's repeated? what seems important as you read through the first time. And then once we do that, we make some observations, and then we go about the interpretive process. So one good thing to do when you study the Bible is just try to get a sense of, you know, what's the roadmap for, for the text we're looking at. Uh, we sort of went through that already. In Daniel 7, verses 1 and 2 is an introduction. Or Daniel, as it says there, uh, he sees a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And he describes in two kind of the opening scene of the vision, uh, wherein the four winds of heaven are stirring up the great sea. And then he goes into the, the various parts of this. He sees the four beasts in succession. He sees the Ancient of Days followed by the Son of Man. And then verses 15 through the end of the book, 
uh, are mostly comprised of the interpretation of the vision. What did it actually mean? What was the point of it all? And then what's interesting is at the very end, in the last verse, we have some uh, record of how the vision and its explanation affected Daniel personally. Uh, it says there that his thoughts greatly alarmed him, his face grew pale, but he kept the matter to himself. So this was a this was a heavy uh, burden Daniel had to carry in just experiencing this and being and have and being able to record it uh, eventually. I don't believe he recorded it immediately, but but at some point he did. Um, we've mentioned Daniel two already, but it's important to note that. There are many comparisons between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 in terms of the four beasts themselves. We talked about that already, four metals and four beasts. Both dated during the Babylonian period. Daniel 2 written during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel 7 during Belshazzar. In both cases, the emphasis is on the fourth kingdom. The other three matter in the grand scheme of things. But the fourth is the one that's emphasized in both of those. Uh, it gets the sort of the lion's share of the text. Uh, what is interesting is in both cases, iron is mentioned in reference to the fourth kingdom. Uh, in Daniel 2, it is the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. In Daniel 7, the beast has great iron teeth. You can see this in verse 7, or large iron teeth. I think there's supposed to be a, a, a connection we're drawing between the two, between the teeth of iron and the iron kingdom of Daniel 2. Uh, in both cases, the fourth kingdom is said to crush and devour uh, its, its subjects, its victims. And in both cases, the fourth kingdom is destroyed, uh, specifically destroyed. And the God of heaven sets up his kingdom. In Daniel 2, the great stone that is cut, remember, uh, uncut by human hand, uh, crashes into the, the base of the statue, into the iron section of the statue, crumbling it to bits. And then grows into a great mountain which fills the entire earth. Of course, it's representative of the kingdom of God. In Daniel 7, the fourth beast is not destroyed by a great stone. It simply says that in verse 11, the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning fire. So even uh, it's a fate even worse than whatever happened to the first three. Of course, the first three sort of fell in succession. But the fourth one is summarily destroyed. And that's another link we can see between uh, these two. In my opinion, the entire point of the vision, I, I don't know if it's even my opinion, I think this is, this is the case. The whole point of this vision in Daniel 7 is given in verses 17 and 18. It says there, and this is after Daniel in verse 16 kind of approaches, and you know, sort of, you can imagine Daniel sort of go up and kind of tug on the, a sleeve of someone standing nearby and say, hey, can you, can you make sense of all this for us? And, and, and he sort of does this, and the one he talks to says, he made known to me the interpretation of these things. That's verse 16. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. Now, kings in this case isn't specifically individuals. It's in reference to kingdoms. Okay, Kings and kingdoms typically represent one another. Verse 18, but the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. This would be the same kingdom referenced in verse 14, the kingdom over which the Son of Man is given dominion. This is the, the entire point of the vision in Daniel 7. This is a view of the future for the benefit of God's people so that they might know a little bit more information about what's coming next and when can they expect the kingdom of God to arrive? When will, and the kingdom of God would be connected with the Messiah, of course. When will this happen and what will be going on when it does? It's for God's people's benefit. Now, one figure that has gotten a lot of, of questions during this is the little horn. So in the description of the fourth beast, specifically Daniel 7 and verse 8, he was contemplating the horns of the beast and then a little one comes up among them, pulls up three horns by the roots. It possessed eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Pretty clearly this would indicate a person of some sort, uh, more than likely a leader. 
horns are representative of power in Scripture. Uh, when one's horn is lifted up, it means God has raised this person to power or dominance in some sense. So the big question would be, well, who is being talked about here? Uh, consistent with the way we looked at Daniel chapter 2, as in the four kingdoms being represented by Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, led by Alexander the Great, and the Roman Empire, the fourth well, beast, it would seem that if this terrifying beast is the Roman Empire, which I believe it is, then a leader from that empire would, I think, necessarily be one of the Caesars, one of the emperors of Rome. It's up for debate as to which one is being talked about here. Um, there are a lot of conservative commenters, uh, most of them uh, even older than maybe modern-day commenters. John Calvin uh, held this particular view, um, which I think he got this right in, in contrast with, with his doctrine on salvation. Um, but a lot of people think that this person has to be a Roman emperor. Now, which one might be up for debate? Uh, many believe it to be Domitian. There are arguments for Nero. There are arguments for Vespasian and, and perhaps someone else. Domitian, I think, gets uh, most, of the, most of the suggestion because, uh, if I understand it right, he was the first to really mandate emperor worship. Uh, it was done but it wasn't mandated, I, I believe, before the reign of Domitian. Uh, he also uh, led in persecution of Christians, uh, really on, on, a, on a wide scale. Uh, it's one of those things that happened, but it happened a lot under Domitian. So a lot of people believe that this fourth beast, this one with eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts, is the Roman Emperor Domitian. Now, if you fiddle with which kingdom is the fourth kingdom. Like, let's say, for instance, you take the first to be Babylon, and then you, for whatever reason, split the Median Empire and the Persian Empire into two, and then you make the fourth empire the Grecian Empire. Then a lot of people feel like this person is anti Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus Epiphanes, however you pronounce it. Antiochus Epiphanes, I believe, is mentioned uh, and referenced specifically in Daniel chapter 8. And he gets a lot of, of, of airtime there. I don't believe that to be the case here in this text. It would be a leader in and around, in and amongst the fourth empire. And Antiochus Epiphanes is, isn't even the leader of the Grecian empire. He's the leader of the leftovers of the Grecian empire after it split into four pieces. So there's all that. But this isn't without some uh, older folks believing this to be the case, Porphyry and being uh, probably the, the, the I know of the oldest one to hold this particular opinion. Um, more popular in the denominational world is this view that the this is this is in reference to the Antichrist. Um, if you associate this figure with the end times, with you know, all of the sort of complicated things that go into that. Uh, there are a lot of commenters that believe that this person would be the Antichrist. Uh, Steinman's commentary uh, is on Daniel's really quite good in a lot of ways, uh, except for the fact that the Lutherans hold this to be the, the Antichrist, and so there's a lot of that. If your commentary on Daniel was written during a time period of, let's say, the Reformation, there are a lot of people who believe this to be not the Roman Empire, but the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I don't believe that to be the case, but you'll find a lot of commenters that believe that since the Fourth Empire is the Roman Catholic Church, then the leader has to be the Pope, and if you don't like the Pope, you know, you call him the Little Horn of Daniel 7. There's that. Um, I think what will help us more than speculating here is thinking about what would this mean to its original audience? Like I said before, the, Dan the, the Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us. It was written to, in this case, the Jews living in Jerusalem post-exile, and perhaps even pre or before they came home. What lessons would they have learned is, is, is the valuable question in, in this case. Uh, what should they have taken away from this? What fascinates me about apocalyptic literature 
with, is even though it's written in symbols and in really bizarre terms to our ears and to our, our eyes, the lessons usually, I say usually as a you know big caveat here, the lessons are usually fairly straightforward. The, the applications to be made are uh, not all that difficult. Now, I say that to say, I, I do want to mention this. Working out the specific meaning of every single symbol can be an extremely difficult thing to do. But the large picture, the, the big points that are made, I believe, are uh, very understandable. Let's just put it like that. For instance, all right, I'll just give you, give, you, give you some of these. So one thing, if you're, if you're a listener or a reader of Daniel 7, one thing you have to come away with is that although kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, as they have prior to Daniel 7 and as they continue to today, God's kingdom ultimately prevails. And that's really in, in keeping with the interpretation that's given in verses 17 and 18. There are four beasts, they, they arise from the earth, but the saints get the kingdom and they possess the kingdom forever. The four beasts aren't there in the beginning and they don't persist to the end. They exist for a, for a period of time, one after the next. But the kingdom of God, it lasts forever. Whoever is a member of this kingdom, they will ultimately prevail. So I think that's one big lesson you want to take away from this. Along with that, even if persecution's going on, as you can see the fourth beast here is terrifying and dreadful and trampling and crushing and so on, He's not just crushing, you know, vegetable. He, he's crushing people. Even though persecution's happening, even though God's people appear to be on the brink of destruction, they mustn't give up hope and they mustn't despair. Because even though it appears like in the moment right now we're losing, in the ultimate sense, God's people haven't lost. God's still in control. His kingdom still prevails, and we need to put our trust in that. And you can see uh, sort of also in this a, a response to evil. We're not to be okay with evil, of course. We're not to enjoy persecution. That's be counter, you know, doesn't doesn't exactly fit the definition. But in the face of evil, we can understand that God one day in his time. And with his power, he will respond. And that good will win out. The righteous will be rewarded. The wicked will be judged. All will be set right one day. And that's a powerful motivation for a follower of God of any time period. But think about how powerful this would have been for Daniel's audience. For the Jews that, because of their sins, they'd been kicked out of their own land and they'd been forced to live in the land of Babylon. And Babylon's about to be taken over by another world empire, which we, we discussed earlier in the book of Daniel. For this group of people, to where it appears like on the surface their God has abandoned them, he's forsaken them, he's thrown them into a foreign land, he has not abandoned them, he has not forsaken them. The name on the sign of the foreign land, and wherever they are, might change. But God and his power doesn't change. And one day, good will win out. And so this could be a strong motivation to continue to trust in God. Why would Israel continue to be with this God? Because one day this God will ultimately win. The gods of the nations will not win. The nations themselves will not win. A powerful and vindictive rulers in those nations will not win. God wins. And if that's true then what we must do is continue to trust his word, continue to trust what he has, his plan, his power. He has yet to be wrong. He has yet to fail in any of these things. So I think these are just some things that, that a, a listener to the book of Daniel in Daniel's time would have come away with. You know, what precisely does it mean that there are four wings instead of three? Why are there four heads? You know, why, you know, three... You can get really lost in the specific details until you remember that this is the word picture. And the picture itself is not the point. The picture makes a point. And so I think these are some valuable points that can be made. 
when we begin to apply the text, now notice we have a difference. Interpretation is what it means to them. Application is what it means to us. When we apply Scripture, it's most helpful if we take the original interpretation and apply that. Because typically, all of the above applies today. And it's true in this case, is it not? It is true that kingdoms continue to rise and fall. We're many kingdoms after the Roman Empire. But God's kingdom, it exists currently, and it continues to not be destroyed. It continues to persist, to exist. Uh, God's people have always experienced destruction. You can see what I mean, okay? The lessons of their time often become the lessons of ours. But in addition to this, we also like to think about how this text connects to Jesus. The Old Testament as a whole points us squarely to the Messiah. And this text, I think, more powerfully than most. Because this text in verses 13 and 14 mention the coming of the Son of Man. And this Son of Man does several important things. He comes up to the Ancient of Days and is presented before him. No, you know, no man can see God and live. Fewer still can approach God. And yet this Son of Man does. This human being approaches God. He's presented before God, which would in, imply a, a great deal of importance. He is given dominion over the kingdom of God. This person, this Son of Man, would be known as the Messiah. Now, Jesus' use of this phrase, uh, it didn't get him in a lot of trouble, but it, 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 cert well, it, 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 it confirmed what he had been teaching, and it confirmed what the Jewish leaders thought he was teaching, which was blasphemous to them. But of course, it was completely true. In Mark chapter 14, I do want to read this one with you. In Mark 14, Jesus is on trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin. Or Sanhedrin. And as he's being questioned, he is asked by the high priest in verse 61, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? So literally, are you the Messiah? Are you him? Jesus said, I am. Now here's our line. You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. He's using ex specifically... Daniel 7's description of the Son of Man, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So when he's asked by the high priest, are you the, are you the Christ, are you the Messiah in Hebrew? He says, I am, and then he doubles down with the Son of Man reference. It's not a coincidence that the high priest in verse 63 immediately tears his clothes and then claims that Jesus has spoken blasphemy. Because if Jesus were not God, this would be a blasphemous statement. They believed him not to be. Of course, he actually was. Now, this Jesus is said to come with the clouds of heaven was presented before him. You might remember in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends to his Father in heaven, how does he do that? It says he is taken away in a cloud into heaven. And paraphrasing slightly. The one that's taken by cloud into heaven is presented before the Son of Man with the cloud, or before the Ancient of Days with the clouds of heaven in verse 13. Okay, I think a clear reference to Jesus. Lastly, Jesus is given dominion and all authority. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, just prior to the end of the book, or right at the end of the book, Jesus declares that all power and authority have been given to me. The dominion over God's kingdom was given to Jesus, and Jesus recognizes that he's the one with this power. Now, I did want to say a brief word about Revelation 13 because John's use of the same type of imagery, the same style of language, and a lot of the you know a lot of the same words even in Revelation 13 describing the sea beast and the land beast, specifically the sea beast, it looks really very similar to Daniel 7, and you can see there from the chart the beast comes from the same place. There's references to a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Uh, both of them have ten horns. Both of them demonstrate blasphemy. Um, and then you get a beast arising from the earth, which I think is also connected to the Roman Empire, but in a different way. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, in our Revelation study. 
uh, war is waged against the Saints, and they're overpowered, and it happens for this limited amount of time. This time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years, 42 months, however you want to put it. Usually, and the reason why I mention this, usually the way a person takes Daniel thir Revelation 13 is the way they take Daniel 7. If they think it means the Roman Empire, then they'll, it'll mean, it should mean the same in both places. If it means the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, it means the same in both places. Um, you know, so how whatever your interpretation of Revelation tends to be, whether it's historical, which I believe to be biblically uh, consistent, or if it's you know one of the other three, typically you take it to mean one of the same thing. In terms of our applications. These are as they have been. And we have some, some scriptures there that sort of back this up. Um, in our day, kingdoms continue to rise and fall. Is it the same four kingdoms of Daniel 7? No. Okay. Are we living during the time of one of those kingdoms? No. Okay. The Roman Empire has been gone for a very long time. But this process of one nation overtaking another, overtaking another, overtaking another has continued in our time. And there are places and there are moments, even currently, where the faithful to God are persecuted for that. It's important to remember that God's kingdom still stands. Daniel 7, written, looking forward to a kingdom. We, in our time, know the kingdom to currently exist. And it's a pretty astounding thing to think about. We have had the kingdom longer than Daniel had to look forward to the kingdom's arrival. The kingdom of heaven, the, the church, the, the body of Christ, you know, that has existed far longer than even Daniel had to wait, or Daniel's readers had to wait to see the kingdom. Just a cool fall. Um, you can see the rest of these. I, I won't go into all of this again because we talked about it again during the, the interpretation section. We as Christians have to continue to not despair, to not give up hope. Of course, we wait for our return of Jesus. And in so doing, we have to trust that God is going to continue to uphold his plan. Um, we can look back on Daniel and see how everything Daniel said would happen, happened. And that gives us motivation to continue to trust into our own future, uh, the words of God. Um, all right. So, uh, one final thing, and I wanted to read this with you. We're um, not quite to 45, but I don't know that we're going to do that in this video. How Daniel 7 connects to other parts of the Bible. This class wasn't planned around having the quote-unquote Christmas season um, be, the, be the backdrop. But a lot of people are thinking about, about this during the month of December. Um, I'm not going to go into Christmas per se, but I do want to show you kind of a neat connection and one that I think for me is very powerful. We've understood Daniel 7 to say that the fourth beast, it would be representative of the Roman Empire. And I think the little horn of the fourth beast representative of one of its leaders. I don't think it's the one in Luke 2, but I think it's a leader of that beast. And it was during the time period of that fourth beast's reign whenever the kingdom of heaven would be established, the kingdom of God, uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Luke chapter 2, for whatever reason, this just this struck me as just a powerful passage uh, in with, with Daniel 7 as the backdrop, with everything we've talked about, with these empires rising and falling, and when would God's kingdom come about? Luke chapter 2 says in verse 1, Now in those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that would be a Roman emperor, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was, in the, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, 
and she wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Daniel 7 encourages its readers to look forward to the arrival of the fourth kingdom, but not for its own sake, for the sake that during the reign of that fourth kingdom, the kingdom of God would be established. And in Luke 2, during the reign of a Roman emperor, so the Roman Empire is in full effect, during the reign of a Roman emperor, God holds true to his promise. He sends his son Jesus by way of having him be born to Mary. And it's at that point whenever God's fulfillment of his plan um, really comes to comes to reality. Uh, G, tangibly speaking, Jesus is here and he is uh, alive. What Daniel 7 pointed forward to happened. And it happened exactly the way God wanted it to. And it's just a really cool, uh, really powerful uh, look at that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, our study. I know it's different from... Like I said, different from what we've typically been able to do in terms of having our class together. Lord willing, we'll get our recording issues straightened out. And we'll be able to put up a video of us having actual class together with our, with our fellow uh, members here at Jamestown. Um, if you're tuning in on YouTube or if you want to tune in live, uh, if you're unable to make it to our services, uh, these are live streamed to YouTube. Um, the next class, Lord willing, will be on the 13th. We'll go into Daniel chapter 8 and think more about specifically uh, the Grecian Empire and its split and the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes and we'll go into to a lot of those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your attention to the scripture and Lord willing uh, we'll be able to study together either in person or if that's not possible uh, by way of this uh, technology. All right. Thank you so much.